I am Mr. Ish and I welcome you to this video. Very recently I introduced you all or perhaps refreshed you all on the concept of conditional convergence and absolute convergence. Based on that video I published very recently, I'll guarantee you two items. Item number one, many students watching that video would obviously be confused by the material in that video because most students generally are. When they look at the absolute and the conditional convergence concept, many are outrightly confused. Guarantee number two, after you watch this video, we fine tune many of those concepts with the five examples I will present to you, all of that confusion will be eliminated. Consider here for a general series in which you can see positive or negative terms. Remember the key word here being general series. We're not talking about geometric series because you have a very good test with regards to infinite geometric series relating to the common ratio. You know the common ratio being less than one, you have a finite sum and you have convergence. That common ratio being larger than one, you have an infinite sum and divergence. But for a general series, if this specific item over here, the sum of your absolute value terms is convergent, then without the absolute value, a series similar to that will be absolutely convergent. Number two, if an absolute value series, the sum of that is deemed to be divergent, then possibly you have the non-absolute value version to be convergent. That series would be conditionally convergent. In essence, it boils down to these simpler statements, which is this. If someone tells you that you have a series which looks like this, it could be alternating positive negative terms, general series, all of that coming into play. If someone tells you something like this is conditionally convergent, then you know that a series similar to that with regards to absolute value terms was divergent. Likewise, if someone tells you you have something which looks like this, a series made up of any type of value could be positive negative, you could have alternating is absolutely convergent, then the corresponding absolute value series is convergent. Keep that in mind, these two specific sentences, keep them in mind as we look through each of these problems. When I present you the questions over here, always look them in the framework as you're seeing here. We're looking at the absolute value version first. If we're looking at something C or D, what happens if we were not looking at the absolute value version of that series? Then we would look for AC or CC, absolute or conditional convergence. Series in which you have positive and negative terms would be those where you would evaluate them further with regards to absolute or conditional convergence. Our question number one will be this. In each instance, I'll already have the few specific terms or the initial terms listed out so we don't spend too much time deriving that. We have something here from n equals one up to infinity, n times two or five to the power of n. We're looking at everything here initially with each question with this always with that form, then we'll see how it relates to that form right there. When you look at this, you have to determine if this is convergent or divergent, you're looking at something like this. It seems like that the values are progressively getting smaller, but if indeed that is the case, we have to find out. You can use a ratio test over here to confirm if this is convergent or not. Based on the ratio test, you have a n plus one divided by a n, the ratio of that limit as n approaches infinity. Remember, the ratio test is a very good test, you can use it. When you're looking at the a n plus one term with regards to this, you have n plus one times two or five to the power of n plus one, all over the a nth term, which is n two or five to the power of n. You have to simplify this because it'll help you evaluate the limit. You'll have n plus one, and then you can open up this parentheses here with regards to the exponent. You'll have two or five to the power of n times two or five to the power of one. Think about it. Common basis, the exponents add as you multiply them, and then here you'll have n, two or five to the power of n. These two items will cancel out. Essentially now, everything is boiling down to n plus one times two over five divided by n. You can open this up, distribute this across the items of this parentheses. You'll have two over five n plus two over five divided by n. Limit as n approaches infinity, you can easily solve this. Divide everything here in the numerator and everything in the denominator by that n. You're looking for the limiting value of this function. When you do that, you end up seeing two over five plus two over five n all over one. Limit as n approaches infinity, this zeroes out. You end up seeing here, based on the ratio test outcome, a value of two over five. Based on the ratio test, if this limit is less than one, you have convergence, and that's exactly what we have. Two or five is less than one, so I'm seeing that this absolute value version here is convergent. Now, if I know the absolute value version is convergent, 
then I know this right here, the non-absolute value must be absolutely convergent and you would not have to waste time doing that extra calculation. You would essentially say for this series now, n equals one up to infinity, minus one to the power of n minus one, which will bring in your alternating positive and negative terms, and you still have this n or n times two or five to the power of n. All of this right here would be absolutely convergent simply because it's coming from this form of a series with regards to all positive values being convergent as we've shown you two or five is less than one is convergent then the alternating version of that series would be absolutely convergent if this is equal to convergent then that version is absolutely convergent and that's exactly what you have if you're given this question over here on an exam you'll evaluate it as such with positive terms and you will establish this convergence by means of that convergence then you can say this version which is represented by this, just an, would be absolutely convergent and your answer would be good. And that right there would be the end of question number one. Question number two, n equals one to infinity. We're always looking here at one to infinity, though in some instances you can do zero. You can't do zero here because you'll zero at the denominator, but in some series questions you can do zero. You have this in terms of an expansion, one over 1.5, one over three, one over 4.5, all of that, one divided by 1.5n. At first glance, when you look at this, you know you're thinking divergence. If you were to do a comparison test, you would compare this to something like one over n square. Here you have one over 1.5 to the power of n. Obviously in terms of item by item comparison, these would be larger than these because here you'd have one over one, you'd have one over four, and then you'd have one over nine and onwards. So the comparison test would fail and you would see divergence. If you wanted to do the P series test, you can also do that. Here, look at this. You're looking at one over 1.5 times n to the power of one. P here is less than or equal to one, so you know you have divergence. So the P series test fails and this series here is divergent. We're looking here at a situation where something like this is divergent. You could even have put this right at the very beginning. You have all positive terms. The absolute value maintains the positivity of the series. But here we're seeing divergence. If we're looking here now at divergence, we can probably establish the fact that this aspect of the series might be convergence. And if it is, it would be only conditionally convergent. And we have to establish that or we have to show that to be the case. How your series will change is in this way. n is equal to one up to infinity. You can do minus one to the power of n minus one. This will bring in your alternating terms. You still have one divided by 1.5 n. When you do these set of terms, you'll have one over 1.5 minus one over three plus one over 4.5 minus one over six onwards. Look at this everything now with regards to the alternating series test, the two conditions. Condition one, each succeeding term should be less than or equal to preceding term, which it is, it is, and you know it to be the case. Condition number two, limit as n approaches infinity, your series will tend to zero or it will because eventually you'll see one or infinity. So based on the alternating series test, this version, which is now as you're seeing right here, this version right here is convergent, but this convergent will be nothing other than conditionally convergent and that will be your answer. If you're given this as a question, you can evaluate it like this with regards to the absolute value version where all the terms are positive. With all the term being positive, your series is divergent. Then you look at the statement here, but your series in terms of non-absolute value version can be convergent, but that convergence will be conditional at best. And you see it to be the case. It's conditional at best. You can prove it by means of the alternating series test. And this question now comes to an end. Question number two, we have something which looks like this. n equals one to infinity, one divided by eight n plus one. This right here is your denominator. You open it up, it looks something like that. Is this convergent or is it not? Is it divergent? Well, you'll have to look at it with regards to these two statements, see which one turns out to be. But we're always looking at everything here with regards to the absolute value version first. And then we go from there. I want to use the integral test over here. When I use the integral test, I am looking at one over eight n plus one from one up to infinity dn. Remember, integral test is a very good test. An integral which is considered to be convergent will have a series that's convergent and the same with regards to divergence outcome. You have to do a substitution. U is equal to 8n plus 1. Du is equal to 8dn. And then dn is equal to du over 8. That's what it is. U1 and U2. You bring these values here. U1 would be equal to 1 times 8 plus 1 is a 9. U2 is still an infinity. 
you can do right here limit as t approaches infinity you're looking at something of this form you have these items coming here u1 is 9 u2 is infinity but that's t you're looking at 1 over u du over 8 this over 8 is really meaningless but we'll keep it into play limit as t approaches infinity you have 1 over 8 and then we have the natural log u coming into play and then you know you're looking at t to 9 one word affecting this natural log t minus natural log 9 natural log t is a natural log infinity and everything here will diverge with regards to series this series over here will be divergent therefore now you're looking here at the second category maybe you can prove this to be conditionally convergent with regards to this aspect of that series where you may see alternating terms and we can do that now you can look at everything as this n equals 1 to infinity we have minus 1 to the power of n minus 1 we have this 1 over 8n plus 1 now we have to see our series what would it be it would be 1 over 9 minus 1 over 17 plus 1 over 25 minus 1 over 33 and alternating series all and on we have to now solve this well you have an alternating series route the alternating series test look at the two conditions is each succeeding term less than or equal to the preceding term it is if you look at everything with regards to absolute value of these items everything is smaller it tests out limit as n approaches infinity does your series tend to zero or it does it'll eventually hit one or infinity or your values will become arbitrarily close to zero you will zero out so you do confirm this modified aspect of that original series by means of the alternate series test and you end up seeing convergence but again this convergence by means of the second rule is going to be conditionally convergent it was originally deemed to be divergent but with regards to this aspect of the series it's conditionally convergent and that's what you can say at best so now you're seeing how this question was handled you looked at everything here with regards to the positive terms and you looked at it with regards to this way or this manner where you have alternating terms and you can see you have conditional convergence come at play a series that's conditionally convergent came originally from a series with regards to absolute value that must have been divergent how about this question number four n equals one to infinity in absolute value we have three times e divided by two e to the power of n plus one how have i developed these items i have a rational function here which should ideally be simplified before you do anything with it and you can we have 3e e in the numerator here in the denominator look at the laws of exponents you have 2 times e to the power of n times e to the power of 1 that's exactly what you have if you combine these it will exactly give you that here you have e to the power of 1 this cancels out with that you're really looking at a series which is 3 over 2e to the n that's what you're really looking at n is equal to 1 up to infinity all of that converts into 3 divided by 2e to the power of n that's your modified series now as you put n equals 1 onwards you end up seeing that 3 divided by 2e 3 divided by 2e squared all of that now you have to see if that series is convergent or not how do you want to handle this i want to handle this by means of the integral test i'm looking at something from 1 up to infinity i have 3 over 2e to the power of n i'm bringing the 3 over 2 out I have 1 over e to the power of n dn. How am I going to convert this into a something usable? Well, how about this? 1 to infinity e to the power of minus n dn. Limit as t approaches infinity. I have 3 over 2 coming out. The constant property of limits, you can bring it out. I'm looking at from 1 up to t e to the power of minus n dn. You want to do a substitution here, u substitution. If u is equal to minus n, du is equal to minus dn then dn is equal to minus du and your limits will change everything will change with regards to this minus n u1 will become minus 1 u2 will become minus t think about it this minus will come all the way outside minus 3 over 2 limit as t approaches infinity i'm looking at now this i'm looking here at a minus 1 and a minus t e to the u du I don't like the fact that a smaller number is in the upper limit, larger number in the lower limit. If I hit everything with a minus, I can flip these around and there's absolutely nothing wrong with you in doing that. You'll have a minus t, you'll have a minus 1. By bringing the minus, I was able to flip the intervals around. What's the antiderivative of e to the u? Well, we have 3 over 2 e to the u. We're looking here at everything from minus 1 to minus t. Bring the upper and the lower limits and the difference of the two. We have 3 over 2. I'll have e to the power of minus 1 minus e to the power of minus t e to the power of minus t will be really e to the power of minus infinity which will be 1 over e to the infinity which will be 0 because it will zero out this goes away you're really looking here at 3 over 2 e as your outcome of this 3 over 2 e is a finite value that finite value represents convergence 
therefore this series over here is convergence. That tells you, you're looking at now at the beginning rule, everything here with regards to the absolute value was convergence. Therefore, if you look at that series in that form, it should be absolutely convergent. And you wouldn't even have to do that calculation. But I'm gonna show you something very brief over here without that calculation and we'll show you the absolute convergence outcome. All of this procedure here is before you, you can see it, but I'm removing it for this next part. We've looked at everything now for this question with regards to this and it turned out to be convergence. Now let's look at it with regards to this and we know it should be absolutely convergent. How would your series look with regards to that? It could look in this way, minus one to the power of n minus one. And then you're looking here at three e divided by two e to the n plus one, which was really simplified to this three over two e to the n. And then you know you're multiplying it by this right here, minus one to the power of n minus one. You don't have to value this out at all. You have this part right here and you have all of this. This right here would represent that aspect of this series. You can automatically go right here to this fact and say that this series right over here would be absolutely convergent simply because the absolute value counterpart of this series was convergent. If that value or in terms of the series is convergent, then this must be absolutely convergent by means of that rule we have over there. And your calculations are saved. You don't have to do any calculation. If you want to do any calculations, you can run this through the integral test. You can. All you'll have to do is run it through and always consider that you'll have a plus or minus one here in the numerator. And then you'll have everything else with regards to your integral three over two e to the power of n. You can always push this plus and minus one all the way outside your integral and still integrate this from one to infinity dn and you'll still have a convergent outcome. That convergent outcome will just be either impacted by a positive or minus one, which is in the grand scheme irrelevant. You'll have convergence here, but it'll be absolute convergence. This question has been done and it followed what you saw right here with regards to statement number one. Our question number five and the last one is a very interesting one. You have n equals one up to infinity sine of n divided by two n to the power of three. I've expanded only part of the series. Everything here is under absolute value. All of these terms should be considered to be made positive. The only reason why I'm saying that is you know sine is a periodic function. If you were to look at it, it's positive in the first and the second and the third and the fourth, it's negative. Because it's a periodic function, keeping your calculator on the RAD mode, you would notice as you look at these sine one, sine two, sine three, sine four onwards, you'll see a pattern established. Sine of one up to three will always be positive values. Sine of four up to six will be negative values. And then sine of seven up to nine, these are your values for n, n equals one coming in here on the RAD mode. These will be positive and they'll cycle. You'll always have three positives and three negatives and three positives and three negatives, but the absolute value will convert all of this into positive. And that's just the nature of a periodic function. Just because you're seeing this, it doesn't mean you're looking at an alternating series. It's not alternating series in the true form of the sense. It's just a series, but the absolute value makes it all positive. These negative values only come about due to the periodic nature of the sine function. That's all there is to it. Anyhow, I'm not breaking that down into further simplified values simply because I don't want to start putting decimals on here. But you can calculate these on your own, but keep your calculator on the RAD mode. When you're looking at the sine function here, you're looking here at a one, an imaginary one sine n. Why is that important? One sine x or one sine n? Because that represents your amplitude. And you know, with regards to the range, the sine function always goes no higher than a one, no lower than a minus one. In terms of the output, of this, you'll always have a value somewhere between minus one to one. But since we're bringing in absolute value, you'll now always eliminate all the negative values. You'll always have a value between zero and one. And that's great because it eliminates the need for you to do lengthy computations for the convergence analysis. You're always looking here in the numerator at a value somewhere between zero and one, but not including zero, but somewhere between zero and one. You can test that out on your calculator and you'll know that to be the case. What that tells you, in essence, you're looking at a series which is really this. And I'm putting here a plus and minus one. Everything here in absolute value divided by two n cube. Now, if you want to do this analysis for this series, which is similar to that, if this was a cosine, it would be exactly the same. You would have a little bit of a change here with regards to the signs because cosine has positive values in the first and the fourth, but you would see and you would understand the point. You're looking essentially at this in this way, and now you can do a P-series test or you can do a comparison test and you can establish convergence. 
If you do the comparison test, you're looking at something like this, you can compare it to 1 over n squared. Each of these corresponding terms will always be less than each of these terms, and you know you fulfill that. If you look at the p-series test, you know it's 1 over n to the power of p. If p over here is greater than 1, you know you have convergence, and we do have a p-value greater than 1. Here, p is equal to 3. By means of the p-series test and the comparison test, we establish convergence for this series. So this series is shown to be convergence. But what that will tell you, when you look at this same series in this form, you must have absolute convergence and you wouldn't have to do any calculations for that. You could rely on that rule or on that statement and you would be confident to do so. Your, this version of this same series would look something like this. n is equal to 1 infinity. You can do again minus 1 to the power of n minus 1 sine n divided by 2n cubed. Let me show you something very interesting with regards to just the numerator aspect right here because the denominator is clear cut. It very easily establishes convergence by means of the P series and the comparison, but the numerator for this aspect of the series right here needs a little elaboration. When you start looking at everything here by means of the effect of this, you'll have positive minus positive minus, you'll have an alternating develop. You'll have a sine of one, then you'll have minus sine of two, then you'll have positive sine of three, then you'll have a minus sine of 4, then you'll have a positive sine of 5, I'm going up to 9, and I'll tell you why momentarily. Sine of 6, positive sine of 7, minus sine of 8, and then positive sine of 9. When you look at, as I'm telling you here, keeping everything on the RAD mode, uh, let's run through this real fast, keeping everything on the RAD mode. Sine of 1 is positive, sine of 2 is positive, sine of 3 is positive, sine of 4 is negative, sine of 5 is negative, 6 sine is negative, 7 sine is positive, 8 sine is positive, and 9 sine is positive. The effect of these values in terms of the periodic nature of sine has to be kept in mind. What you look here, positive minus positive minus, looks like a true alternating series, but when you account for the effect of the sine, what happens? You have a positive output here, positive here, positive here. You have a minus here, minus here, minus. And then you'll have a positive, positive, positive. When you bring these signs together in terms of your expanded series will look for the first nine terms. You'll have a positive value. You'll have a negative value. You'll have a positive value. You'll have a positive value. You'll have a negative value. Here you'll have a positive value. Here you'll have a positive value. Here a negative value and here a positive value. Look, it's not truly alternating anymore. Every other term is not specifically alternating in terms of the signs. You're seeing a grouping here of signs. And this grouping over here of signs eliminates a true alternating series in terms of the utilization of that test. You can't really use it, but you don't need to use it. You have a series in terms of the absolute value that's convergent. Its non-absolute value counterpart must be absolutely convergent by means of that rule or that statement you have. You can just rely on that confidently and you can say that this here would be absolutely convergent because this aspect right here was convergent. Remember what the two statements were at the very beginning in those two lines I had. If a series has been shown to be absolutely convergent, then its absolute value counterpart was convergent. If a series has been shown to you to be conditionally convergent, then the absolute value version of that same series was divergent. Keep that in mind. And that brings us to the end of this video. Hopefully there are no confusions after this. And these questions very well should show the benefit of knowing these two over here. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.